Alright. I like the way you start think with that. <laughs> um, it being after 10 o'clock, I'm going to call to order the public hearing on House Bill 1622 relative to the use of passenger restraints in motor vehicles. Just a couple of things for the audience and for everyone else, too. This is a public hearing. Um, I've had several representatives call and let me know that they're sick and couldn't make it today. Um, and I apologize about that. However, public hearings do not require quorums. It's just we, we're going to listen to the testimony and the committee members will have access to that testimony and the clerk's notes to, to catch up when it's time. All right. Um, with that, I'll call the prime sponsor bill, Representative Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Skip Cleaver. I'm representing Hillsborough 35 in Nashua. And my prime sponsor of the bill, HB 1622 FM. The primary purpose of the bill, obviously, is to get better compliance for the use of seat belts. And the, the whole idea, of course, is safety and saving lives in New Hampshire. Last year, or the, the last year I have figures for it, there were 14,955 lives saved by the use of seat belts. <clears throat> Another 2,500 should have been saved or could have been saved but didn't have belts. And overall use of, of seat belts nationwide is just over 90%, 90.7 use in New Hampshire is 67 so we have a compliance issue <clears throat> as far as injury or prevention of injury and death 47% uh, safer with seat belts in the front seat and 60% 60 60 more safe in the back of any vehicle involved in the crash the uh, Vehicles of today are designed for seat belt use. <coughs> Excuse me. That is to say, they're designed for airbag <coughs> combination with seat belts. And if seat belts are not used in today's automobiles, airbags themselves can become very, very, very dangerous. Another very, very large danger in the lack of seat belts or non use of seat belts is ejection from the vehicle. <coughs> Ejection from the vehicle nearly always involves death or severe injury. So compliance is, is an, an issue, which is why I wrote this as a principal, uh, principal uh, law rather than a secondary law. The statistics show that compliance nationwide is much higher in those 35 states which have have a primary position on this law rather than secondary. 35 states have primary and 12 have secondary. And with that, I think I've had enough statistics and the use of all uh, seat belts throughout New Hampshire is improving, but needs a, a, a vast improvement to get to where we should be. In, in the high 90s. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you might have. Questions from the committee. Representative Tularski. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. I'm not sure if someone who's speaking after you will be better <coughs> um, in a position to answer this, but does New Hampshire, is New Hampshire not receiving certain highway funds due to not having a restraint law? I'm not familiar with that and I would like to know that myself. Thank you. Uh, Representative Torosian was next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking the question. Do you have any numbers on the number of motor vehicle fatalities in this state last year? I do not. I'm hoping that maybe it's something part of the safety okay. Thank you. Representative Chair Chow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, Representative. Um, you mentioned 67% compliance in this in the state, and I believe last year it was 73. Can you just tell me where you where you're receiving these this, these this data? Department of Safety. New Hampshire Department of Safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for taking the question. How do we pick uh, gross domestic vehicle weight at 8,000 pounds or less? That would involve most passenger vehicles. No particular reason other than a lot of times heavier, heavier, heavier vehicles do not use seat belts. Why that is, I don't know, but I have several people input on that. Uh, yes. Thank you. And in drafting the bill, did we make sure that a passenger vehicle is a ton and a half, two tons, trigger half ton capacity, so a gross vehicle would say 5,000 pounds, this is eight. Did we make sure that there are no conflicts between this and the commercial carrier regulations? I'm not aware of any conflicts. Uh, Legislative services didn't mention any conflicts. Anyone else? Representative Gagney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Talking about school buses that will have to be equipped with seat belts uh, after June 30th of 2020. So the other ones would not have that restriction. So those kids could still ride around and bounce around. My question is, how would the bus driver get those kids to secure in the seatbelt? How, how do you make them, how do you tell a six-year-old or a seven-year-old that you got to put, it, put on your seatbelt? Well, that is a problem, and when they're used to not having them, that's an issue. But I, rather than mandate seatbelts on buses, I thought it would be good to get new buses that were being introduced to be equipped with them. And then we deal with the requirements and the compliance of that requirement later. But at least coming coming online, the new ones should have seat belts where the old ones do not. As they're replaced, then we can move into requirement for seat belts on buses. Follow up? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this bill that passed does not affect individuals over 18, is that correct? How do you mean? Is this, if this passes, would this be compulsory also for adults? This is universal for all people. Oh, uh, thank you. That's the whole idea. Thank you. Okay. 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 Anyone else with any other questions for Representative True? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, when the uh, section of concerning school buses kicks in, is the school bus driver liable for a fine if the kids aren't belted in? That would, that's not that's not included in this bill. That's <coughs> new new legislation. As I said, the only reason to include school buses in here is to begin to have them on board, to begin to have the new buses equipped for for safety, safety bills. That would have to be done with separate legislation. Did I see your hand? Yeah, I was just pointing out that Representative Smith had his hand up. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What will the increased cost be to our school districts for buying buses with this new regulation? Very minimal, according to the school people I talk to. Most buses are coming equipped with seat belts anyway. It's becoming manufacturing part of the manufacturing uh, uh, procedure to equip buses with, with seat belts, as I understand it. It may be more expensive not to have them. Any other questions, please? Do you have a follow-up? Well, yeah, can I, can I ask you to explain that? Well, the standard procedure is to have them equipped in all buses leaving the assembly line, then an exception to that would be more expensive. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. One last. Okay. And and when did that federal rule go into effect? There's not a federal rule, to my knowledge. It's a recommendation, but not a federal rule. More and more states, though, are adopting school bus belts, so manufacturers <coughs> are responding. To, I don't have any data on that, but apparently. Manufacturers are responding by equipping all buses that they manufacture with bills. Okay. Anyone else have any questions for the 
Representative. Seeing none, thank you, Representative Cleaver. Thank you. I'm going to give you guys a chance to take your seats. Before I call the next person. Good morning. Representative Knuth, please. Oh, I don't know who's sitting there already. Thank you very much. yourself. You know, For the record, I am representing Jerry Carroll, representing Carroll District 3, Madison Camera, Albany, and Freedom. And what I probably should have mentioned yesterday, too, is that part of the reason I have a degree interest in this, uh, also a, a retired orthopedic surgeon with a specialty in spine surgery. That's what I did in my previous life. Now, in my medical training, there were many patients that were memorable, but there is one who has always stood out as the most memorable. About 44 years ago, when I was a third year medical student in Boston at the Beth Israel Hospital, and I cared for a 20-year-old woman in the ICU, she had been involved in a motor vehicle accident on the Jamaica Way, not a high-speed road, ejected from the vehicle, sustaining a severe head injury. Um, this made enough of an impression, I still, I mean, I remember what I had for breakfast, but I remember her name. I remember the name of the nurse that I shared the work with, with her for the week, um, most of the week. But we worked hard to save her, but ultimately she was brain dead. And she was, you know, just a couple years younger than I was at that point in time. It does make an impression. And the best way to treat an injury is always to prevent it. And that's what we spend a lot of our time on in medicine and in public health. Seatbelts prevent drivers and passengers from being ejected during a crash. People not wearing a seatbelt are 30 times more likely to be ejected from a vehicle in a, in a crash. And more than three out of four people who are ejected in a, in a crash die of their injuries. This is a little less complicated than yesterday's bill because we're not worrying about whether they died of a head injury or the other multiple trauma. It's, it's really basically the ejection. We know that there's not as much injury inside the vehicle if you stay there now between belts and bags. In any case, Using seatbelts will reduce serious injuries and deaths by about 50%, and more than half of the people killed in car crashes weren't restrained at the time of injury. But as I commented yesterday, fatalities are only one piece of it. The traumatic brain injury is a really big issue because a traumatic brain injury is a life-altering experience. It certainly can be, it can be mild, uh, but it can be significant. They consume a significant amount of uh, resources, medical resources in the acute phase, and often, if you have a non-fatal TBI, you may require extensive, expensive rehabilitation. Yesterday, I was asked a question, I know we shouldn't talk about the bills, but it's the same principle, about what the most common mechanism of head injury in New Hampshire is. I tried to do a little bit of homework, didn't have much time, but as best I understand from the TBI report from DHHS in New Hampshire, it is falls. Particularly, that's true in the elderly. But it's important to realize that that's just a raw number. The denominator of the number of old people in this state is pretty high, a lot higher than the number of motorcyclists. So the fact that it is more common doesn't mean a lot. You have to look at rates. Secondly, we're capable of addressing more than one problem at a time. And indeed, in injury prevention, you address any and all things that you can deal with. And false <coughs> prevention is something we do work a great deal with, with a number of interventions. In any case, um, you ask about uh, New Hampshire data. I don't have the full year from last year, but I did hear that as of January 23, New Hampshire had seven motor vehicle fatalities, two were pedestrians, five were motor vehicle passengers. Four of the five motor vehicle passengers had been wearing no seatbelt and had been ejected. Mandatory seatbelt laws do increase seatbelt use, and we heard already about 90% in the country, but only about 70% here. Once again, I want to focus though on the economic impact of this decision, because the economic impact of a failure to wear a seatbelt is enormous. Nebraska did a study where they identified that medical costs were over twice as high for people in motor vehicle accidents if they were not wearing a seatbelt. And once again, an NHTSA study was done looking at the excess thing, and I know there was some confusion what that meant, so I'll give a quick example. If you have an accident, 100 accidents, you have an intervention that saves 50%, <coughs> that means 50 people would die, 50 people wouldn't die because they, if, if, sorry, if you had use of 50% as well, 50 people would die, 50% of people would not die because they used it. Um, I just said that wrong, if they all use this. <laughs> Let me back up. The bottom line is, okay, I'm not explaining this well. I just quickly wrote this down while Skipper's talking, but the bottom line is that excess is, when you look at the statistics and you say, 
if everybody had used it rather than just the 70 percent of state seatbelts that did, what would be the extra people who would not have died? Sorry, I didn't say that for a while. The example I used is muddled. So in 2010, again, NHTSA broken down by states showed that the failure to wear a seatbelt resulted in 3,000, this is U.S. data in this case, I couldn't find New Hampshire, 3,353 excess lives lost, and the economic loss was estimated to be $1.4 million for each death, and there were 50,000 excess serious injuries, and that had an excess economic loss of 107,000 per injury. So those are real numbers, they're real, they're real substantial numbers when we're dealing with it. Um, I dare say that the young woman I took care of way back then, it was probably only a a few hundred thousand dollars, but that was, you know, 1975 dollars wasn't very much. But these costs do not disappear. They're simply shifted to other people. The Idaho Transportation Department has found a recent study that uh, at the society at large picks up 75 percent of all crash costs in, incurred by individual motor vehicle crash victims. And those <coughs> the costs, and these are all the costs of, of management, their costs are passed on to the general public through insurance premium, taxes, direct out-of-pocket payments for goods and services, and increased charges for medical care. Again, there is no tooth fairy who pays the bills if we have these problems. Now, people who oppose this bill usually point to their right to make a decision about the risk they want to take. But once again, with the decision, with the responsibility to choose a risk, you have a responsibility to bear the cost, but it simply isn't born, as we just saw. It's mostly shifted to everybody else. Those excess costs aren't absorbed by that individual who makes that choice. When that individual who's been involved in a significant motor vehicle accident rolls in the EW, we don't get the history that they didn't wear a seatbelt, therefore they're not worth saving. We work hard. We're trained to try to save them, do the best job we can. And it's also legally required that we would do so. But the, this kind of care creates significant costs. Many of them might be uninsured, and those costs will obviously just be either eaten by the hospital as a loss or shifted to uncompensated care funds. They may be on Medicaid, where it goes off to Medicaid. The ones that are on insurance, they're still not bearing it because they're paying a premium of perhaps two, three, five thousand dollars whatever, and a deductible, but that's nowhere near the cost of the rest of those costs. All of them get shifted to all the rest of us with increased premiums. So the bottom line is that this, if you look at it from a saving lives point of view, this is a good bill. If you look at it from an economic point of view, <coughs> this is a good bill. We really should pass this to try to encourage better utilization of seat belts, save lives, save money. Thank you. Can we take questions, Representative? Of course. Any questions from the committee? Representative Soros. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative. You mentioned that uh, an individual is 30 times more likely to be ejected from a motor vehicle than not wearing a seatbelt. Do you know if that number has uh, been a lesser number in recent years with airbags, if that's helped at all? Actually, I, I wanted to find that. I was unable to find that information. I, I imagine it is out there, but I don't know the answer. But we do know that airbags are designed to be more used with seatbelts, not in place of seatbelts. Quick follow-up, Chair? Yes. Thank you. Um, you mentioned numbers for two, uh, this year so far, the fatalities. Do you have fatalities for this state from, uh, from full year 2019? No, that's what I said. I don't have the oh, past have years. I only had the, All right, I'll the January 23, I think, but some guys behind us might know. <laughs> thank you. Further questions from the committee? Representative O'Brien. No, thank you. Uh, Representative and Doctor, I know what you're talking about, being a firefighter, you always remember some of the best ones that are in here. Uh, and I've had a couple of them too out on the road. But, however, this bill has two different sections to it, it appears to me, and it includes some school buses. And do you have any information on the <coughs> school bus? I mean, the, it seems to me the bus is designed to take some impacts and everything. And you know, it's an apples and oranges situation in a way, is it not? <coughs> I, I did not dig up data on the school buses, though I do have some personal experience on this particular one. Um, our, the, when my child, when our middle child was in middle school, um, his band went on a trip up to Nova Scotia to be in a band thing. 
some of you may remember this because it kind of made the news that that uh, vehicle turned over and uh, four of the kids in that in that uh, bus died. Um, I do not know for sure how many were ejected, but this was a bus that was not using seatbelts. This was a fair bit of time ago. So I, but I don't have statistics. That's only an anecdote. And I, I, I am not as concerned about this the bus thing as much because I really think the numbers there probably are smaller. If you have a bus accident, we generally tend to hear about it. Motor vehicle accidents, they're pretty common. For the questions from the committee, <coughs> Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming today and taking these questions. I'm still having trouble wrapping my head around the insurance argument because in New Hampshire, health insurance does not pay crash costs. That's just not how it works. So thanks to online accounts, I was able to go back and look at my last seven years of car insurance and we have insurance on four vehicles. It's gone up a total of $10 over those seven years. Mm -hmm. So how is this bill? Uh, what effect is this going to have? I mean, it's 10 bucks. It's not even, well, it's a little over a dollar a year. Well, actually, I, I don't really care if it's health insurance or car insurance or what insurance it is. Insurance comes from a combined risk pool that we all participate in. I can't explain why it might have only gone up $10. But we also know that there are massive amounts of uncompensated care that our hospitals have to give, much of it to motor vehicle accidents and uh, other accidents, that they just never get paid for. I, I, don't, I don't have any sense of how much of it is unpaid debt from insurance companies or from the person, but the point is, it's costs. These costs don't go away. I don't care what mechanism we're using to supposedly pay for it, they don't go away. <coughs> they get shifted to all the rest of us. Uh, Representative Pinner. Yes, sir. It would seem to me then, I want to just get clear your argument as well. I want to sort of follow up on Representative sure. Smith. It would seem to me that <coughs> if we do not have a seatbelt law for adults here in New Hampshire, and have not had one, to my knowledge, ever, then the impact on insurance rates would remain fairly stable relative to that issue. I would presume so, because it hasn't been a change. In other words, if you're looking at is there a change in time, you would usually correlate that with some other uh, uh, variable that was changed. If we haven't changed the state belt law, then you would expect it to change. But again, I, I'm really not prepared to speak to okay. the intricacies of which funding source because it's really <coughs> relevant to the argument. Thank you. Any other members of the committee care to have questions answered by this gentleman? By the other member? Thank you. Yeah, just one. So. There are 30% of folks that are not in compliance. Do we have any idea what the actual cost is? The 30 folks who are not in compliance, 30% not in compliance, also involved in an accident, and of the costs associated with that accident, the one specifically attributed to not wearing a seatbelt, any idea what that number is? Actually, I, I do not have that for New Hampshire per se. That's why the number I used showed in the US. 3,353 excess lives, economic loss 1.4 million per each of those deaths, 54,000 excess serious injuries, economic loss 107,000. Again, by excess meaning, these are the ones that would not have occurred had seatbelts been used using the uh, accepted rate of injury prevention from wearing that seatbelt. I'm sorry, one, one follow-up question? Sure. Uh, so those are New Hampshire numbers? No, I said those are national numbers. So you don't have any idea what the numbers are? I did not find in this particular NHTSA, I, maybe it's <coughs> specific New Hampshire numbers. But actually, you know, with all due respect, if it's a um, million dollars or five million dollars, there's still costs that we're bearing that we could use better in other ways. We could use that money to improve vaccination rates or to treat uh, the elderly who uh, you know, need better medical care. We don't need to be spending it on something that is a waste because people don't wear seatbelt. Okay. Uh, Representative Chair Chelly. Mr. Chin, um, the compliance portion, are we trending up, down? I do not have data on that. Again, I may have some people behind me who have better I'm data. I'm expecting Captain Haynes to okay. share that. <coughs> quick, quick follow-up. Yes. Um, how important do you feel uh, education 
plays in the part of the, the public being educated on this particular issue in helping perform the schools? Oh, I think education is always helpful. But it's also we educate our kids not to steal things, and we educate them not to use drugs, and we educate them all kinds of things, but they don't always work. Uh, enforcement does have a role, I think, for sometimes getting a secondary level of education. You can educate by telling people where your seatbelt, you can educate them by stopping and finding them, and explaining to them that you really ought to wear your seatbelt. That's a whole different level of education that we may have all gone through once with a speeding ticket or something, and it kind of reminds you. You kind of learn something right then, don't you? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Representative. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question of the our witnesses. Representative, would you like to have your seat? One second. I'm going to talk to the representative. That's okay. Your choice. Um, Mr. Williams, you asked to try to get done before a certain time frame. And, and Chairman Sykes, thank you so It has much. to be now if you're going to meet your deadline. Thank you so much. And members of the Transportation Committee, my name is John Williams. I am the Director of Legislative Affairs for the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to coming before your committee today on HB 1622. Uh, yesterday, I was before the Senate Transportation Committee on a very similar bill, which was Senate Bill 609. Um, and there were a couple pieces of that bill that I would recommend to this committee for its consideration. And for clarity of the record, the department is not taking a position on this bill, but we do recognize the value from a public health standpoint for uh, individuals uh, wearing and using safety devices that would protect them from further injury. And so <coughs> two items that I would bring to the, this committee's attention on Senate Bill 609 is that bill actually has built in at the very end of the bill a provision to making a uh, law building on New Hampshire's uh, law that we have for children to apply to all citizens of New Hampshire as a secondary violation. That was one very important thing that we see incrementally that is very helpful in terms of saving lives. Uh, rather than necessarily uh, the bill as it's currently drafted here before you on 1622. The other item on the bill in the Senate that it included in the exceptions of the um, uh, issue of several things, including buses. So this bill actually takes on one additional more piece that that bill does not take on. And I would suggest to you, given the complexities of that issue and staying focused on the bill in front of you, that you may want to consider also looking at Senate Bill 609 in terms of how that was carved out uh, in, in that particular legislation. In terms of the impact, and, and you'll see on this bill here, there's a local FM uh, associated with it. Uh, <coughs> however, our agency did not receive a, a fiscal uh, uh, request from the LBA to doing an analysis, but what we would like to offer very briefly is in the context of long-term care. As completely correctly identified by Representative Kinnerick, uh, a physician, that what we're looking at here are ejections uh, from the motor vehicle. And you're going to hear from Captain Haynes, I'm going to defer questions regarding statistics and other information. He's got, he's got all the answers to those questions, and he's ready to testify on that, on those issues. Um, but in terms of long-term care, if an individual does survive uh, being ejected, there is a good chance and probability that they may sustain um, traumatic brain injury or other similar debilitating conditions. There is a cost associated not only with the medical treatment initially for stabilizing that patient, but also with long-term care costs. And in the state of New Hampshire, currently, for acute care uh, uh, facilities, nursing facilities, the average cost is $64,000 per year. So there is a cost to New Hampshire citizens in terms of taxpayer dollars that are paid out there to care for individuals who otherwise can't afford those very, very high rates in the event that they do require long-term care after being ejected from a motor vehicle. Also, you'll uh, perhaps hear testimony also from Captain Haynes and others in the community that there are secondary impacts to first responders who come to the scene. If, uh, uh, testimony from yesterday uh, came forward from Deb Pendergrass from the Department of Safety that it does have an impact on individuals who provide this care. It also provides an impact to what it has to ER doctors when they're having to treat individuals who otherwise would sustain lesser injuries had they been using their safety belt. New Hampshire is a state of very conscientious people. In New Hampshire, people make really good decisions on their own, and they abide by laws as well. And we believe that with an incremental step, a very incremental step relative to a secondary uh, violation, that you would encourage some additional individuals to actually uh, uh, clip uh, their safety belts. And what we're trying to do here in the bigger picture is simply put as the following. Saving one life 
at a time by using your safety belt. So one click at a time. So with that, that concludes my testimony. And I want to thank you so much for allowing me to get over to the other committee, Commerce, which I have to say, you folks are, uh, 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 Chairman Butler is wonderful, but I have to say a much more wonderful experience being in front of this committee today. So. One brief question. One brief question. <coughs> thank you. Um, if you could just clarify and help me out, thank you for taking the brief question. I know you have to be somewhere else. School buses seem to be included in this. So what's your uh, official opinion of school buses on this particular issue? I, I think that the issues of school buses are very important, and I will leave it to other individuals behind me to talk about that. But I think when you're trying to look at the goal of creating an incremental step around the use of the safety belt, that's taking on perhaps one more conversation additionally, and you might lose a little focus on the underlying goal of uh, by trying to take that on those two pieces in the same legislation. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I have a question for the chair. Yes. I'm all set, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I did, can we clarify that this bill does not mandate school bus seatbelt use? It just puts in a provision that new school buses that are acquired have seatbelts? Does not mandate that those people. That is my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Captain Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Captain Bill Haynes. I'm the commander of the New Hampshire Office of Highway Safety. I'm also the New Hampshire State Trooper and identified by my uniform. Uh, <coughs> it's a commander of highway safety is to promote uh, safety from a behavioral aspect. I wanted to share some things with you today. Nationally, in 2017, there were 37,133 motor vehicle fatalities in New Hampshire, or not fatalities, motor vehicle crashes, resulting in 102 fatalities. Why is that important? Of those 102 fatalities, 17 were a result of rejection or partial rejection, 16% of them. But more importantly, 70% of those occupant fatalities were unbelted. So notice what I'm saying is 16% were rejected, the, the remaining delta between that overall 70% were people who died in a motor vehicle crash as a result of not being belted. Fast forward to 2018, there were 36,560 crashes. Uh, and then in nationwide, it's, it's interesting to know that there, the number of crashes we had almost matches what the fatalities were nationwide. Uh, you see a decline in crashes in New Hampshire, which means we're doing things well. We're, we're making some great improvements uh, through laws, whatever. However, in New Hampshire, we saw a significant increase in fatalities, realizing 147. It had been 10 years since we had that many fatalities. Of the 147 fatalities, 24 were related to ejection or partial ejection. Again, 16%. Now, that's important if you follow through. <coughs> the number of unbelted fatalities was 71, or 70% 70 again, of all vehicle occupants were unbelted who died in these motor vehicle crashes. Again, 16 and 70. It's a trend. Nationally, we have the highest percentage of unbelted fatalities at 70%, almost 71 nationwide, of unbelted fatalities. We're followed by Montana at 64% <coughs> and Dakota at 63%. So we have the, the dubious distinction of being the only state in the nation without an adult seatbelt law, and we have the highest unbelted seatbelt fatalities across the nation. That's, that's where we stand today. In 2019, unfortunately, I can't give you total crash numbers yet. That hasn't been, believe it or not, that hasn't been provided to us yet. But to date, as a correction, as of this week, we have 10 fatalities in New Hampshire. We're ahead of, it, our, of where we were last year by almost 66%. Three of those fatalities were due to ejection or partial ejection. 30% of the people who crashed already in the state of New Hampshire, and this is what we know at this moment in time, and some of these crashes are still being evaluated through the car team, Already, 30% of these people have been ejected. We're waiting on the number of unbelted fatalities that hasn't been provided to them yet. New Hampshire has an average seatbelt usage rate of 70%. Last year was an anomaly, it was at 76%. And, and on average, though, we average about 67, 68, 69, 70% of average voluntary seatbelt use in the state of New Hampshire. Comparison, as was stated earlier, to 90% nationwide. We do have a survey that's conducted through the Office of Highway Safety every year through the University of New Hampshire that provides New Hampshire specific data on this number. <coughs> this is something that we have to do as part of the Office of Highway Safety. This has been stagnant for many years. The Office of Highway Safety has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on education, media, and enforcement. Unfortunately, it appears voluntary seatbelt use has plateaued. 
So all the money we spend in education, need everything else, we are, we are across the board for years, as I've demonstrated, we have, we've got to do something different to reduce fatalities. In comparison, states with either a primary or secondary seatbelt law still observe, on average, a 43% non-use rate. In other words, they have laws, but there's 43% of the population who make the personal choice not to wear their seatbelt. The delta between the two, 70% usage rate here, and that 43% is 27%. So if you take that delta, in theory, if we took the 102 lives that we lost in 2018, and we took that delta, we could have saved roughly 27 people by simply having an adult seatbelt law. You take that and roll that into the, the 147 lives that we lost last year, you're well up over 35 to 40 lives, and by simply having an adult seatbelt law, statistically, we could have saved that many lives of undelted fatalities inside of motor vehicles. The New Hampshire Office of Highway Safety contracts to conduct an attitudinal survey every year with UNH. We, we, we talk about things that evolve traffic safety from behavioral aspect. The survey reflects that 57% of the residents surveyed in 2019 support an adult seatbelt law. 6% were listed as neutral. Of that 57%, 43 were strongly in support of a seatbelt law and 14% uh, were somewhat in support. So the population is saying through these surveys that they would support a seatbelt law. In closing, I want to talk a little bit about an initiative New Hampshire and many other states took to curb impaired driving and save lives. And you may ask, well, what's this got to do with seatbelts? But bear with me. From 1973 to 1994, New Hampshire had an average of 163 fatalities. So average them all out, we averaged 163. In 1994, New Hampshire took the bold step, many people like yourselves, in the interest of saving lives and lowered the BAC rate from 0.10 to 0.08. Now what was the effect? The result of that initiative has reflected positively on this state and the rest of the states in our nation has lowered our average fatality rate for the period of 1995 through 2019 to 126. So that one small step saved that many lives on average for that period of years. Imagine, just imagine, sitting in this room if we were able to save 26 souls. Think about that. We could save 26 souls with a stroke of a pen. I, and lastly, what I'd like to share with you is, is I, I have a young daughter. Uh, well, she's not young anymore because I'm not young, but that's good. In 1996, she was 16 years old. She was involved in a motor vehicle crash. She was in a Toyota Tacoma pickup. They hit a big bull pine tree down in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Um, she was ejected from the rear seat. They found her walking up the roadway, damaged and bloody. The two people in the vehicle died. They were seat belted. One person in the other vehicle is paralyzed for life. But I got to tell you, if you see my daughter today, she wears a seat belt every day. She's alive today. She's alive today because for some strange reason, which is against everything we've ever taught her, she was not wearing a seat belt. But to the next day that she got out of the hospital, she put a seat belt on. To this day, nobody rides in her vehicle without a seat belt. She'll be the first one to tell you there was a freak incident, that the odds are better to not get injured and to stay alive by wearing a seatbelt. And that's not because I'm a police officer, because at the time this occurred, I was an active duty military service member. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'll entertain any questions you may have. Representative Klein. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for taking my question. Thanks for giving us all that data. Um, you're saying we could save 26 lives, but is that because we would give people tickets? How do we know we would save 26 lives? I guess what I'm asking is, in your process of research from the other states, how, when they, before they in, in, enforced this seatbelt law to when they did, how many lives have they saved? The average 20 to 30 percent on average in every state. There's a difference in the delta between a primary versus secondary, which really gets into the weeds. Um, but overall, from just having a seatbelt law, historically, there's a 20 to 30 percent savings on fatalities. Thank you. So whatever their fatality, they have much higher fatality rates. We're very fortunate. Um, so. uh, I have Representative Lafon. Uh, uh, did I lose track? I think. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, but I will yield in turn. <coughs> uh, Captain, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I've been here too long. I've heard similar bills in the past to this. And at one time, the federal government was going to give a safety grant to states that were, you know, 
had mandatory seatbelt laws in their particular states. Is that window closed as far as you know with the federal government? If we were to enact this bill, we, did we lose out on that? No, sir. We have, um, there's two types of grants that are given. And from my perspective, we have a, a NHTSA grant. It's behavior related. It's called 405B. It's a special <coughs> grant for occupant protection. Um, we use, uh, we, for the very first time ever in the history of New Hampshire, we qualified for a very small portion of that by doing an assessment to talk about, the, to talk about what we needed to do to move forward. Um, we, and, and part of this should be an education process, and that's where that funding would come from, both an education and enforcement piece would be what money we would qualify for through federal highway safety. And Mr. Chairman, one brief follow-up follow that I, I will yield in turn. Uh, could you explain to the committee the benefit of that? And where would this money go in the safety-related issues uh, for our state if we were to enact this? From the, from the highway safety perspective, um, what we would do if this bill were to pass, obviously there needs to be a period of time to where, where people are brought into and in, informed about the law and to make them aware and before you kick off any type of enforcement, just to make people aware that, hey, you know, there is a seatbelt law. But more importantly, why there's a seatbelt law and, and what the impact is for not wearing the seatbelt. Uh, and the other things that we utilize for the additional money would be to get into the younger uh, groups of people coming up in life, the, you know, the, the junior high schools, the high schools, and then the young people in their colleges to get some type of education. And the, the largest piece is going to be media, is education people, why it's important to wear them, the fact that there is a law, and when that enforcement's going to take effect. And of course, the, the smallest piece of that is to follow up with enforcement. So once you have a period of time of education, much like you did with the distracted driving law, with the handheld device law, then people will be accustomed to doing that, and, and we do some enforcement to back up, to reinforce the importance of wearing a safety belt. And, and that enforcement obviously would be secondary nature in this case. Did I lose Chief. track of somebody who had their hand up? <laughs> <laughs> Representative Tarosian, then. Thank you. Just to thank you, Kevin, for taking the question. Just to follow up on a question I asked earlier um, in regard to usage, um, you obviously have numbers, statistics of um, the percentage of people in the state that are wearing seatbelts. How do you determine that? What does the process determine what that percentage is? There is a, it's a, it's a NHTSA standard, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration standard that UNH operates under, and what they do is they deploy people in specific high crash corridors of the state, and they actually monitor seatbelt usage, um, and they come up with 70%. I will, I will say, and I'm glad you asked that question, Mr. Representative, because I'm not sure that it's entirely reflective of all New Hampshire, because they don't just do New Hampshire plates, so they're counting people wearing seatbelts coming in from states that have a primary seatbelt law, so therefore I, I per personally believe and professionally believe that that number is actually lower. Because if I drive every day, I do an independent survey, it sounds crazy, but if I drive from here back up there, uh, I'm showing 70% unbelted, not 70% belted, just counting cars sitting at a light, looking who's belted, who isn't. Um, so that's done by UNH survey uh, each and every year for us. Follow up? Yes. Is there, is there any process to determine um, the demographic set? In other words, the younger people say under 25, um, in high compliance of wearing them, that's not a compliance issue, but a greater percentage wearing them than, than people that, that say 40 years of age, 50 years of age. Is there any data to show? There is. The it's usually um, the biggest, oh, I don't want to use the word offender, but the biggest non wearing people, because it's not offensive, it's not a lot, um, is people in pickup trucks and SUVs for some strange reason, males, um, and usually between 34 and 50 years old are the ones that are being discovered to be most commonly unbelted. Just one last follow-up. All right, go ahead. Thank you. In your opinion, then, the, the fact that younger people are wearing at a higher percentage, do you think that is because of education, They're getting more education at a younger age makes a difference? Absolutely. We do have, uh, we have money already. <coughs> because we have a law on the books now for under 18, we go into the schools actively, and we go ahead and use highway safety money and other money from Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital and we conduct classes throughout the high schools and educate on the importance of wearing safety belts and restraints. And what we're finding is a lot of those kids are now saying to their parents, please don't drive without buckling your seatbelt. And parents are following those rules to set that example. So you're, you're spot on. It's, it's, it's an education. Thank you, Kevin. Well, Representative Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Captain. I'm curious as to the data end of things when we have seatbelt compliance or not, are there also um, other 
compliance issues or non-compliance issues on other laws that maybe in combination with uh, fatality, such as distracted driving, maybe someone wasn't belted and were using their handheld phone. I mean, is it is it just is the data broken down into single data points as the belted, not belted, or a combination of things that uh, we track? There's, we are tracking data. We're getting much better at tracking data, to answer your question. Historically, in the past, we have not been as detailed. However, now we track multiple causations in multiple you know, positions of vehicles, seat belts, no seat belts, speeding, distraction. Um, you know, and we focus a lot of impaired driving, to your point, but a lot of this impaired driving is, is impairment causes you to make poor decisions, and poor decisions results in not wearing a seat belt or speeding, or, and that's, so we're focusing primarily, in our crash system is just now getting to the point where we can track Thank you. I think I have Representative Brian next, and then Representative Smith. He hasn't asked a question, so I'll do it. Well, look at that graciousness. Ooh, thank you. Representative Smith. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. So the, uh, the numbers you were citing earlier were 16%, like the 70%, and the percentage of people that were in fatalities and not wearing a belt. Is there a correlation, though? I saw one crash where something went through a windshield and killed a guy, and whether he was wearing a belt or not, that's unfortunate and it's not going to make it. So of that, is there data to show if they had been wearing a belt, fatality wouldn't have happened? And that larger percentage should have said it. The, for the ejection, there is. Inside of a vehicle, it's tough, right? I mean, if you're asking me, could I concretely say that two people died? What I will only want to share with you is if you're not belted, you're rolling around that vehicle. And what's even more disturbing is I could be belted and you could not be, and you roll on the vehicle and kill me. And, that, and that's tough. Um, so I think just being restrained in all positions, and we focus a lot on front seat positions, but in, if you just think about it, if you see crashes on the side of the highway when people have a lot of stuff in their vehicle, and then you see it for a mile and a half down the roadway, imagine being inside of that vehicle where that crash occurs and what's going on side, inside. So that'd be a very hard statistic to pull for you, but we do know for a fact that the people that were, who were deceased in that vehicle were not wanted. Now, that's a corner issue or a medical examiner issue as to how do you correlate you know, was that person in the right rear, and then all of a sudden hit the person in the left front, and, and, and that's tough. I, I couldn't, but I can I can only give you concrete percentages on ejection or, or partial ejection. But we do know that 70% historically have been who have died in motor vehicle crashes have been unbelted. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have to imagine it. Uh, been there twice, but what I was getting at though is we're getting a lot of data in. And I didn't want the committee to have the perception that the claim is that 70% will be fixed. I mean, there's, there's no causal link for that, is No, there? it's 27%. Potentially, statistically, 27%. Because remember what I said, 43% of states with belt bars are not buckling up. It's a personal choice. We all know that. What do you do is don't. Um, and then there's a consequence. But what I'm saying is that it's, we get voluntary compliance of 70%. And we have states with laws that have 43%. There's 27% of the people we can affect. That, it, that just having a law in the books is affecting at least 27% of those people nationwide that are now belted that probably wouldn't have been belted. The other 30% is another challenge, right? Where we have the 70 volunteer and that 30, that's a challenge. I just want to capture between states with belt laws and you know, our state without one. There's a, there's a target. There's 27% of the people that, as good citizens, because they're speed bars or they're distracted bars or handheld bars, are automatically buckling, buckling up simply because we all know, psychologically, because it's a law. And simply because it's a law, we're going to have more people buckle up. Whether you enforce it or not is the issue. The fact is, statistically, we're showing having a law in the books costs it. Okay. Uh, Representative O'Brien was next. Uh, Captain, thank you again for taking my question. I'd like to thank uh, Representative Talersky's uh, clarification from the chair. But I want to get back to the school buses so we can change gear with this or vehicles. Uh, it does say in the bill that all school buses manufactured after June 30th, 2020. Do you have, you know, data on that, that, you know, school buses should have because I'm looking at the individual municipalities on this. This bill, if it went through, if they were to buy a school bus this year, the date of June 30th, 2020, doesn't allow municipalities to anticipate that 
that cost in purchasing, whether the municipality purchases it or the provider purchases a brand new school bus. And if, if it, even if it's an independent contractor, those extra costs to provide that school bus will be reflected back into the taxpayers, you know, to do it. So get back to the data. Should school buses be included in this bill? You know, I, I think we would be doing better if we take a smaller bite in the apple, in my opinion, would look at the vehicles separate, and then maybe in the future bill, look at school buses as a standalone issue. I would, I would concur for this reason. This is still in the midst of studying whether or not there is a <coughs> data to, to um, require seatbelts from the federal level. So therefore, if, if this is still struggling with whether it should be a federal rate, then maybe we should step back. Follow up, if I may. Go ahead. And what you're talking about is CFR 90, which basically follows the rules of the road for truckers and everything else like that. So we should perhaps wait for the federal government to come up with over the road, which the school buses do apply to, because they license, you know, the CDL licenses and everything else. So we should probably wait, well, take a look at the federal government and wait to see what their testing is on this, correct? I think that would be a prudent approach until the, the Fed rule either way. Thank you. And uh, Representative Tru is next. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. A lot of statistics are being tossed out and they can be your friends. Anecdotally, you said you felt that 30% was New Hampshire uh, seatbelt compliance. Just anecdotally from what, from what, you, what you said. Could you give me the figures again of the New Hampshire survey of the people who favor mandatory seatbelt laws so I can compare that to the 30% that use them? It is. It's, uh, right now, under, uh, historically, across the board, an average of 50%, and last year, was only 50% of the residents favored a seatbelt law. They were asked specifically, would they support it, would they be in favor of a seatbelt law? Of that, 43% of those strongly support the bill, because they had two answers to that. Strongly support and somewhat support. The other 14% somewhat support it. There was 6% that were listed as neutral that would have gone either way. So, by ultimately 57% support it all. I have Representative uh, LeWare was next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the presentation. Well, um, let me just tell you the total of 147 Yes, sir. Uh, under that, I noticed that the question is considered an unbuilt fatality. No, sir. Uh, they have to be in a motor vehicle that, was, that, is, that has belts installed and um, it comes from the manufacturer with belts. That's what we would count as an unbuilt fatality. I have Representative Tolerski next. Thank you. Thank you for providing this information today, Captain. Um, can you just speak for a moment about enforcement and from the view of a law enforcement person? when you're um, either pull over a car for a different violation or you see a car go by you, what's, how do you do it? Can you see if, I know you can see if the strap maybe is coming over the driver's shoulder in most cases. Can you just talk about that? Because I know that there's been concerns about, you know, if you're pulling people over just to look in their vehicle to see if the belt's buckled. How's that going to work? It's like, a, it's a, similar to an inspection sticker. After a while, you get up, you get trained, you, you have this automatic function. It's front plate, inspection sticker, seat belt. It just becomes a habit. Um, the commercial world's been nice because they put orange seat belts in, which makes it really easy, right? I wouldn't advocate putting orange seat belt in any of my cars. But the reality is you can see a seat belt. There are, there are times when you have to take a second look because they have the adjustable seat belts and they have to go down. And that's why in some ways, doing this in a second <coughs> initially and, and seeing how that works is, is more, acceptable to the public because we're not stopped. We're not out there looking to just stop you from seatbelts. Uh, and honestly, Representative, seatbelts, I don't know, I'd be hard pressed to just be focusing on seatbelts in my day-to-day -day driving uh, unless I was on some special detail. It's mm -hmm. more important about how they're operating. But I think to answer your question, the short answer is that you, you become trained to do it. I mean, it's an automatic thing, front plate, sticker, seatbelt. I mean, it just gets bred into you as you drive down the road. Representative Klein Knight. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you did my question, Officer. Um, uh, Representative True asked you how many were in favor. You said, was it 45%? 
57%. And is that broken, that survey, was that able to be broken down by district? I have to check. Okay. I, I'm sure they could have. Okay. At least I can tell you what area the survey was taken in. But It'd be interesting to know who favors that more where they live, especially for us who we represent each district differently. Thank you. And, and just for the point, of, what you'll find is is that it's rural roadways are the less represented, um, and, and that's important. We didn't, we don't do a lot of surveying of rural roads. I don't know what areas you're from, but that's that's another challenge. Mm -hmm. Representative Ferocious. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks again, Captain, for taking your question. Uh, do you have currently, or could you get statistics for fatalities the last four years reported for the other New England states for comparison purpose versus with us? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Actually, send that to the, if, if you want, you can send it to the full committee, that data. Um, and if you can't find a way to do that linking wise, you just send it to me and I'll follow. Thanks. So. Anyone else for this, for the captain? Seeing none, Captain Hanks, thank you very thank much, you, sir. <coughs> uh, I apologize if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, James Geyser? Jim Geyser. Geyser, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I, I take my best guess at it, no, but sir. it's a tough That's thing fine. to do. <coughs> Would you introduce yourself and where you're from and who you represent? My name is Jim Geyser. I'm from Sandwich. I've been for 35 years and I'm here representing myself. I'm here to ask you folks to vote down this proposed bill in any form. I have listened to statistics while I've sat here and I have listened to people try to put dollar values on personal freedoms. My story is far more personal. I grew up in upstate New York when I was 18 years old I was in a car accident. I was driving, I was the only person involved. I was told I was going about 80 miles an hour, went off the wrong side of the road, into a telephone pole. Snapped the car in half. 67 Fairland. It was a nice car. He found me in the back seat. I spent two months and 17 days in the hospital. 56 days in traction. And I now walk with a fake leg on my left side. And I wasn't wearing a seatbelt that night. Sometime after I got out of the hospital, I had the opportunity to speak to two friends. Jacqueline Young and Norman Jeffords, who were both on the fire department. Norman was there that night as well as Jackie's mother. Norman told me what happened that night. How they decided I was going 80 miles an hour and found me in the back seat, because I have no recollection of that. And he also told me if I had been wearing a seatbelt, there was no way I could have survived that accident. As I mentioned, I was found in the back seat. If I'd been belted into that driver's seat and I went into that pole, came right towards the front post on the driver's door, I would have stayed strapped in that damn seat. And both my legs would have been cut right off. They'd have either stayed in the front half of the car or wound up in Giffy Cook's front yard. That didn't happen because I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. I've never told that story in that detail before. Anyway. I am not going to sit here and insult the intelligence of anybody by saying people should not wear seatbelts. If people want to wear a seatbelt, that's up to them. I know one night 41 years ago, unwittingly, I made a decision not to wear a seatbelt. And because of that, I am able to sit here today and tell you that story. 
this bill that you have in front of you takes that right to make that decision away from the residents of this state. Whether it's right or wrong, the decision people make, it's their decision that should be. And I've got my say. Thank you. If anyone from the committee had a question, would you take it, sir? Oh, well, certainly. Any questions from the committee? Representative Fine Knight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for your brief testimony and your story. I'm sorry that you had to go through um, that trauma. Do you currently wear a seatbelt now after the accident? I can't. I can't bring myself to do it. Anyone else? <coughs> Thank you, sir. <coughs> Thank you very much. Roger Richard. <coughs> Hello, I'm Roger Richard, and um, where are you from, sir? Excuse me. Where are you from, sir? I'm from Indiana? Newberry, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I'm a native of New Hampshire, born <coughs> 1962 in Manchester. I'm 57. I do not wear a seatbelt. Never wore a seatbelt. My mom probably carried me in the front, the front seat, in her arms. I don't have an issue with people that wear seatbelts. You purchase it, wear it. I have an issue with people telling me that I have to do something for my safety. Again, I'm 57 years old. I know what I think I need to do. And if I say something that offends anybody here, I'm very sorry, okay? But I have statistics myself. I have a passion for a New Hampshire resident. We always have the saying, New Hampshire way of life. This is my way of life. It is being free. I've been driving New Hampshire roads for 41 years, legally, on my own. And every, every year, every day, to go to work, except for four years when I did the United States Army for four years. I find it hard to believe today that I can be legal driving here without a seatbelt and possibly tomorrow being a criminal or having a misdemeanor against me when I've done nothing wrong. I drive, I have no accidents, I have no tickets, I've done nothing wrong to anybody here. As we know, I'm, I'm sorry, we do not have an epidemic in this state. You hear numbers of 147 people dying in New Hampshire highways. I have a median of 112 throughout time. That's the middle of the road. It's not an epidemic. For 35,000 people in the country die of automobile accidents. They all have seatbelt loss. So approximately 34,900 people die, and they have a lot. Many people die in automobiles. Automobiles kill. They also talk about seat, um, airbags. Airbags was mentioned here. Airbags also kill. The company Takata has 38 million recalls, 179 different automobiles. There has, I don't know the young lady, but a young lady died of an airbag because of the shrapnel inside the vehicle. Again, we're told safety, put your seatbelt on. We're gonna provide airbags, you're gonna purchase it. I don't trust a company I don't trust the government that tells me what I have to do. I trust myself. So far, at the age of 57, I'm doing okay. And I have taught my kids to wear seatbelts because it's a lot. I have been here many, many, many years. I was told that I was a child leader because I said no. And the word came up, and I wasn't going to mention it, but I will. Incremental. The person mentioned incremental. Once we do this, well, I said the same thing back in the 80s. If you start a child at six, you're gonna go up, and you're gonna go up, and you're gonna go up, and you're gonna knock on my door someday. Mr. Richard, you think way too much. Apparently I don't, or I do, because you've been knocking on my door for many years. Enough is enough, I say. <clears throat> okay, um, I went off my track here. It's a false sense of security. 
Now, people also say, they talk about, oh, people in their rights, people in their rights. Well, I was in the Army for four years. I took a federal oath to uphold the Constitution. I also was on a budget committee in Goffstown, New Hampshire, and I took an oath to uphold the state Constitution. I feel either I'm not in the Army and I'm not on that budget committee, but I still have that oath. And the oath is to protect the Constitution. I'm going to say that this law violates three of our constitutional articles. First one, Article 2, natural rights. All men have certain natural, essential, and inherent rights, among which are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and a word of seeking and obtaining happiness. That's pretty, that's pretty strong. One word, happiness. I'm happy the way I drive. No tickets, no accidents. I'm not creating anything. Um, we have natural rights, and it is liberty. I looked up liberty in a dictionary. The right to choose. I have the right to choose. So if I get in my vehicle, I have the right to choose. Choose my own safety in my own vehicle. It's my vehicle. Article 3 <coughs> of our state constitution. Society, we've heard about societies, the money of societies, the money, the money, the money, okay? Article three of the state constitution says, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. And without such an equivalent, the surrender is void. I'm, I'm gonna sit here and say, I give up my natural right of freedom of speech in a movie theater. I cannot yell fire. Why? Others will be affected. Others. But me and my vehicle, by myself, 95% of the time, affects me. It's not others. So under the Constitution, if it's not as equivalent as protecting others, the surrender is void. That's big. We cannot have this bill because of that. And also, Article 4. Again, it was mentioned about conscience. The right of a conscience, unalienable. <coughs> Among natural rights, some are in their very nature unalienable, because no equivalent can be given or received for them. Of this kind are the rights of conscience. My conscience is clear. I have no tickets. I have no accidents. I have automobile insurance, and I have health insurance. When I was working, and I'll get to that too, but when I was working, I had disability insurance, I had sick leave, I had everything I needed to protect my life insurance. Everything I needed to cover myself and others. And that's key, others. We, we um, talked about finances, the finances of everything, about this and that, and how much it costs for unseat belt to people and this. I have looked at bills from hospitals and everything. I think other people have too, many other people. I have never heard one person say, whew, that's reasonable. Bills are unbelievably expensive for hospitals and doctors. Unbelievable. And it's not because of non seatbelt use people. It's because of society. We have that society. It's granted to us in the Constitution. And you cannot sell people's rights to protect them and from money. You cannot save money, you cannot steal people's rights. It, it's unconscionable. And I'm going to leave this, and I hope I don't offend a lot of people. 35,000 people died in automobile accidents, 120,000 people died by accident in the hands of doctors. And they're the ones here saying, we need this. Accidents happen, and we have to leave it as accidents happen. Freedom exists. Thank you. Yes. Hold on for a second. You you all set with your testimony? I am, sir. Okay. Questions? You'll take questions? I sure will. Uh, we just need to go through a little bit of no the form on that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Representative Pine. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for my question. Thank you for your service. You didn't offend anybody. I hope I don't offend you with my question. I do not get offended. Okay. Thank you. You talked a lot about how money isn't relative to this and I appreciate that. But in the same breath, you talk about how you have life insurance 
because of your decision. And in Article 3, I, I just want to run this by you, affecting others. What do you think would happen if you were ejected from your car because you didn't wear a seatbelt and you did pass away to your family? Just because you left life insurance, they will still be affected. And I wanted to know your thoughts on that. That's correct. They will be affected. It doesn't matter if I'm in my car. I could be walking down the street. They said the two pedestrians got hit. It doesn't matter if I'm riding a horse on a plane. Things happen. We all bite the bullet someday. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else? Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Thank you very much for your time. <coughs> My apologies, Mr. Chair. Oh, I didn't. I got a call. Oh, yep. It's me. I'll be back. You guys have a seat? Just change your name tag to Representative Dale so the public knows who everybody is. Oh, oh I see. You changed the map. Yeah. Change the seat. Change the seat. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
has no bolt, hole, or anchor points available, and if this car has a rear-facing third seat that kids like to ride in the back, there's a gas tank right up underneath the, the seat portion of the well. If I try to put seat belts, I, I, and, and I thought about maybe trying to put seat belts and fabricating something underneath it, I can't do it. The gas tank's right up against it. If I have bolts go through and it protrudes, and I get hit or something like that, and that gas tank goes up, punctures it up, it's gonna be just like the Ford Pinto. Boom. So, sir, I'm gonna stop you one more time. I okay. thank you for bringing this technical flaw to our attention. You are correct, it should be 1968, not 1967. And certainly we can take a look at that from the committee for correcting purposes. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I just want to say that as a whole, I, I oppose this legislation based on freedom in New Hampshire. Living, I am a New Hampshire resident, and one of the reasons that's keeping me here in New Hampshire is a lack of a, of a mandatory seatbelt law. If they put a seatbelt law in there, there's no advantage of living here anymore. I could go live where it's warm, like in Florida, where you know ultimately I might want to do it. Um, they have a mandatory seatbelt law down there, but if they have it up here, I mean, it, the incentive to stay in this state where I've lived here for the past 55 some odd years goes away. And, uh, and, that, and that's what I have to say on this. And again, thank you, sir. It's it, one of the things for one of the purposes for having public hearings is to bring out all the information that we can. It's good to learn that if we have a little, if there's a flaw in the bill as written, we can we have time to fix it. And also, when you talk about enforcement, when, when they're saying, oh, they're going to be counting, see who's wearing a seatbelt. I bet you when cars from 67, 68, even into the 70s, I mean, they, the uh, seatbelts, they had two piece shoulder straps and like the 72 Nova. Sure. It was strapped up along the headliner with a regular lap belt in it. Nobody ever used those because those things were a pain to try to set up every, each and every time. So nobody ever uses them. Do they count those cars as well? He's not wearing a seatbelt even though he's got a lap belt on. Right. And the other thing too, I was in my, in a Tanscom Air Force base because uh, I work on, I work for MIT. And uh, I drive, of course, I drive my 63 Chevy in there. Now, I guess I put a, I put a seatbelt in the front seat because <coughs> the anchor points are in there. But still, I get pulled over by the, uh, by the military people because they say, oh, you don't have your seatbelt on. I said, you're going to have to look right here. Pull out my stomach. There it is. Because right. you can't see it because they, uh, they automatically assume that there's shoulder straps in those old cars. Will you take questions, sir? Sure. All right. Any questions from the committee? Representative O'Brien. Uh, thank you. Uh, to the indulgence of the chair, the honorable gentleman from Nashua did bring up a good point, but my question probably would be better answered by the captain if he so wishes, because uh, as the chair knows, we have antique vehicle laws in the state, which basically follow what the manufacturer and does not so much modification. So would it not be that an antique car does not really need to have these modern modern modifications? So I can answer that question. In fact, that is true. Under the laws of the New Hampshire that we currently have, antique vehicles are treated in a whole separate way in terms of compliance with current day regulations. Right, but a lot of law enforcement does, they're, 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 they're unfamiliar with that. And so you go, people drive the old cars, they still get asked. I'm getting hassled on the fact that I get a two-year sticker on my car, and uh, it's supposed to be, you know, people think, oh, we have to get it inspected every year, but an antique vehicle gets inspected every two years. A couple of times I got pulled over. The other times I got pulled over was the fact that I'm using year of manufacture plates, which are, are legal in this state. I'm always getting hassled on that. Fair enough, but that's a yeah. separate problem. That right, exactly. But I just, wanted to, I just wanted to point out the fact that, you know, we're getting treated in a little bit of a different angle just through ignorance of, of a lot of the law enforcement. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate okay. your testimony today. There, thank you. Um, Mark Raposo. I hope I got that right. Yes, you did. A bit of a challenge today. Good morning, sir. Introduce yourself, where you're from, and who you represent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mark Raposo. I work, I, I'm from Wayne, New Hampshire. I work for Community Transportation, which is a school bus company out of Jaffa, New Hampshire. And I am also the president of the New Hampshire School Transportation Association. Uh, concern on the fact that this does include school buses. 
Back in 2017, we had House Bill 196, which was a totally dedicated to uh, seeing about seatbelts in school buses. And I have a copy of the final report that came from Representative Stephen Smith as the chairman. And at that time, it was determined not to move forward, see what the feds are doing, et cetera. Some of the challenges with having uh, seatbelts on school buses. The bus comes to a stop. When buses are loading and unloading, that is when the majority of accidents occur. We are now going to increase the amount of time at every stop. You could have a group stop with 20 kids getting on a school bus on Loudon Road, and it's going to come to a dead halt until they're all putting their seatbelts on. Small children, kindergartners, first graders, they have difficulty. How are they going to get their seat? But the driver cannot get out of their seat. The driver has to remain in their seat with their seatbelt buckled. So small children are going to pose a problem. There is a district that did mandate seatbelts. I believe somebody said they had six buses. In the afternoon, the staff gets on, <coughs> goes up and down the aisles, make sure all the seatbelts are on. As the driver is driving out of the school, what do you hear? Click, 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 click. They're all on buckling. School buses have compartmentalization. The way the seats are designed, this, it keeps this within the compartment. The feds increase the height of school bus seats. They're now three inches taller than they used to. So we follow that federal mandate. The driver cannot be held accountable. That would have to be clear that the driver cannot be held accountable if they are wearing their seat belts. The driver can't see. The seats are hot. Okay? Even if they're a shoulder strap, if you have a little first grader, if I'm driving a bus full of elementary kids and I look in my mirror, guess what I see? An empty bus. So you can't see it. We talked about um, additional cost. Buses come off the factory uh, with just regular seats. To have additional, to, to put in the seat belted seats, that's a special order. I talked to Brian Cressy, who is president of WC Cressy and Sons out of um, Kennebunk, Maine. He is a Thomas dealer. The cost to put in a 77 passenger bus, uh, seats with seat belts, is an additional $7,500 per bus. Okay. That would be money that the districts would have to incur or the private carriers would have to incur. Going down the road, that cost would certainly be passed on back to the school districts. And I do have a copy of the report from 2017. Yeah, I would like you to leave that. That'd be great. No problem. You all set, sir? That's all I have. Thank you. Will you take questions? Absolutely. Yes. Representative O'Brien. Uh, as a father of grandchildren, I do know different size, you know, preschoolers. And, but the seatbelt works best with booster seats and everything else. I mean, the bus companies don't make several different variations of seatbelts depending upon the size of the child. Uh, so would not just follow into an additional cost for the school buses to put the child into a booster seat to eliminate any type of neck or strangulation type of injury with the child because of their, their torso height. You can also um, have, they're called built-in five-point harnesses. So within, rather than just having the left sh shoulder belt, this thing pops down, the student gets up in it, it's a built-in booster. Those are available. We use those in many of the buses to, to carry preschool children. It's a five-point minus. Anyone else from the committee? Representative Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for taking my question. You quoted a cost of uh, approximately $7,500 for seatbelts in, in, um, in the school bus. Are those just lap? Are those lap shoulder. I do have one more. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed the answer to your question. The cost was yeah. lap and shoulder. It's a, it's lap a lap and shoulder. shoulder. Okay. 
Thank you. I'm sorry, I'll get distracted. Representative Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A new voice to be heard from today. I woke up. Um, <laughs> thank you for taking my question. You mentioned earlier that um, most of the accidents to the school bus occur at the stops. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? I found that interesting, and I, I, I'm not sure what to make of it. So if you could explain that a little bit. Well, with loading, loading and unloading, people um, passing and running through their reds, children falling, things like that. So, so that's relative to the actual school bus. Excuse me. I'm supposed to ask for a follow-up. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was thinking of it in terms of moving accidents with buses. I mean, do you have actual statistics as to how many accidents occur with the bus not moving versus when the bus is moving? I don't have that, but um, Sergeant Kelby from Pupil Transportation could probably provide you with that information. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. I do, I do have one more thing if I could. Oh, please. Um, Somebody pointed this out to me, and I'll just bring it up. It says all school buses manufactured on or after June and used in the state of New Hampshire. So does that mean that buses coming from Massachusetts have to have seat belts and buses coming from Vermont need to have seat belts? Let me read it again. Uh, Hold on. Just it's a question. I would interpret it to be yes, so, but again, I just would clarify though that this is buses manufactured after a certain date. There's no mandate to put them in after the fact. It's manufactured after that date. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. you're, not, you're not quite released. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you can't unclick this, that belt yet. I know in the example of the city of Nashua. Nashua owns a couple of school buses, and I don't know if they rent them or whatever the deal was, but it was passed to the, uh, the company. Do you know actually how many municipalities own school buses and not through an independent service provider? <laughs> I, I don't know the numbers. Uh, you know, Concord, Fall Mountain, Merrimack Valley, Bow, there's quite a few. Lebanon. Owns their own buses? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, what is there? Second. Right. You all right? Yes. Is it, thank you, sir. Is there anyone who cared to speak on bill, House Bill 1622 who has not had the opportunity to do so at this point? Okay. All right, seeing them, can I have the blue sheet, please? I thought I was going to talk after the first one. All of our buses are coming to the first student. I didn't put them in order. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, the, 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 I'm sorry. We did buy some before we came. They're run by first service. I was under the impression that all the buses you own by first student. We were going to purchase at one time for purchasing your own bus. Good morning. Some of the fleet. Or maybe. All right, so hold on. I had uh, had 14 people signing in opposition to the bill. No one signed in in favor of the bill. With that, I'll close the public hearing on House Bill 1622. Thank you, folks. That's it for until this afternoon.